If you have not already, um, please visit this URL and I will do my best to put it in the chat for folks uh, and log in to the type platform. Good question. Does the environment matter? They'll both work, but pick the top level one. I think it's called a general update. When eventually you do get logged in, uh, you'll either be dropped into this type content uh, references directory, or you might be dropped in, in in one of the the levels. But the path that you need to follow is to be in references type content uh, under content. There's a directory called notebooks. And under that, there's something called webinar series. And then the next one is the cloud. I'll, I'll say this again. Don't worry if you're panicking and you've just lost the thread. I'll say this again in a minute. Um, there are two notebooks that are available. This is really just going to be up to up to you. One of them is called uh, zero the cloud and zero the cloud live. The live version does not have code in the cells. I'm going to be using that so that you can watch me live code. If you want to see the code ahead of time to try to anticipate what I'm going to do and figure it out, that's fine. If you want to code along with me, that's also fine. If you have no intentions of coding at all, that is also okay if you're just here to watch, um, but you, you do have choices. So as a very brief overview of what we're going to do, uh, the, the topics we're going to try to hit tonight are what the type platform is, the, sprint, the principles kind of behind cloud platforms, why you might want to use them, advantages, We'll try to define some of these things um, and we'll also uh, talk about querying for maps data and actually accessing things um, and then finally we'll show sort of a concrete example by uh, accessing test data and showing an image so there's a lot of text here uh, i know you can all read this so i'm not going to uh, read every single word but I'll, I'll try to give you the general big picture overview uh, type is the time series integrated knowledge engine. It's not my favorite acronym, but uh, it, it works. Um, and it, it uses Jupyter Hub to allow people to access um, things on the cloud. Uh, there's no need to install anything. You can just work on whatever your internet browser of choice is, and it lets you get spun up right away and working in this cloud environment. Some of the advantages of, of working in the cloud there are basically two, and once we understand what the cloud is, it, it becomes easier to see why those are advantages. So when we talk about the cloud, and I'm going to say that a whole bunch this this session, um, we're generally referring to the practice of remotely accessing computing resources. And a lot of times this is done in a very clever way where your resource uh, allocation scales up as you need more and scales back down, and it, it takes a lot of the load off of making sure that you have enough servers available to accommodate things. So for example, all of you logged on, hopefully are getting on there relatively quickly um, onto this instance of Tyke. If we were doing that, we would have to make sure that we had enough servers for however large our class size was. But the nice thing about Tyke is that we don't really have to worry about that and everybody can just kind of get on, get their own server and, and get working. We, the archive, don't have to maintain servers big enough to host this a class of this size. And in general, the cloud really just means, as Randall Monroe somewhat humorously put it, the cloud is other people's computers, right? There's a lot of complexity around it, but at the end of the day, it's just other people's computers. And in this case, it's a set of computers that are running in the uh, the AWS data center in, in Northern Virginia. This brings us to one of the advantages. Uh, when you're working in this cloud environment, you do not have to rely on the internet infrastructure between you and the mast archive in Baltimore. There's there's no dependence on, on having a good internet service provider. I know that I certainly don't have the best. Um, there's no need for a lot of speed to be able to, to um, transmit the data back and forth. So in this particular diagram, we're trying to demonstrate that within the platform going from a, a Tyke instance to the data from a particular mission like Tess or Kepler, which are available in our cloud copy of data, is very quick. The, the infrastructure within a data center is generally very good, and so it allows you to transmit data back and forth at, at speeds that just aren't possible when you have to rely on bigger, bigger picture internet infrastructure. So that's advantage one, is just quick transfer of files back and forth. Uh, the other advantage is also that you can just log in. So most of you hit the login button, and hopefully we're dropped on this page relatively quickly, 
and you're good to go. You're you're ready to start programming. There's no wrangling environments. There's no handling dependencies. There's it's it simplifies the process of getting started by a lot, which is why it makes a great teaching tool and is why we're using it right now. Um, an, an important point to clarify is that you actually don't have to use this platform. Again, we use Tech for convenience. It's easy to get started. Um, it, it has things pre-installed for you, but cloud data is available to you outside of this platform. You can uh, download from the cloud to your machine. And you could also set up your own cloud instance to be next to our data. Um, it's not particularly easy to do necessarily, but but you could do it. Um, you'd have to pay to get it set up and, and figure that all out and debug it, which we've tried to do for you, but but you could do it. Um, your options aren't aren't limited. We're we're only giving you more and more options. Um, so that's kind of some of those key points. Um, and I've I've sort of alluded to this last thing here already about accessing cloud hosted data. Uh, you you could from your local machine download data from the cloud, which will then have to go over traditional internet infrastructure. But you can also, while on Tyke or your own cloud platform, load files directly into memory. Because those data center connections are so fast, that lets you more or less trick the machine into thinking that those files are stored locally on your hard drive. I don't have a multi terabyte hard drive, so I couldn't host all of the test data. But by working in this environment, I can more, more or less trick uh, the platform into thinking that that data is local. And that you know you can read it in and, and close it as needed. So that's kind of the, the big picture overview of um, what tech is, why you might want to use it, what we're going to be doing here. Do make note of something that occasionally happens that's very difficult for us to control. If you're currently seeing Python 3, IPy kernel in the top right, go ahead and click on that and change it to test environment. Uh, I was talking about how great it is to have all the software pre-installed, and unfortunately, uh, it is a security risk for us to force you to use a particular kernel, so we can't uh, control that with perfect accuracy. So please please do make sure that this says test environment um, before you start running these cells, or they won't work. Okay, so talking about software, things that are available as we're diving in, uh, there are some packages that we're going to import right off the bat. Uh, the most important one is probably this astroquery.mast uh, observations module. It's what we're going to use to do all of our querying for data, and it's also going to provide us some of the cloud hook-in functionality that we'll need uh, to, to actually look at MAST on the cloud. The other thing to be aware of is S3FS. It's the S3 file system. So that's the thing that will help us to convince our machine that these files are local. It'll it'll open the cloud files and uh, read that stream in like it's read it from, the, from your local machine off of a hard drive. If anyone is new to Jupyter, I'm going to be talking about the shortcuts. To run this first cell, once the cell has been selected, uh, that's a shift enter. You'll get that little asterisk to let you know that the cell is running, and it's actually already turned into a one on my screen. Um, once it becomes that one, the cell is finished executing. The next time you execute a cell, it'll be numbered two, and so on and so forth as we progress throughout the notebook. All right, so we've got our packages imported. Now what we need to do is uh, enable our cloud data set. We need to, we need to search on that instead of the, uh, the classic master archive. So what I'll do is I'll use observations.enable cloud data set. Another tip for those of you who are new to Jupyter to Jupyter Lab, and this took me far longer than I care to admit to realize. If you hit tab, it will offer you suggestions to autocomplete what you're typing, and this saves a lot of time. Uh, I I shudder to think about the amount of time it took me to discover that. So I'm trying to save you all from that fate. <laughs> uh, the second thing that we have to do after enabling the cloud data set is also enable this file system. So we'll, we'll uh, set up a file system instance, um, and we'll we'll initiate that with this s3fs.s3 file. Let's tab to complete s3 file system. Anonymous a n o n equals true. Uh, we just have to add that because the s3 uh, the stsci uh, bucket of public data that's available to people. You can't authenticate into it. There's, it's, it's all public, 
uh, and there's your credentials will be rejected. So you can't pass anything in. You need to tell it, I am an anonymous user trying to um, trying to access this data. And if you if you don't specify anonymous equals true, or I guess give it some valid credentials, it won't work. Um, so that's the that's the setup portion of this. Now we actually need to start thinking about data queries and, and how we're going to get uh, something interesting. So as I mentioned, astroquery.mast is a, an astronomer friendly way to query for mass data. It's the API that we've that we've written uh, to access everything that's in the archive. We're going to use it in this notebook. We're going to use it throughout the course of the webinar. It's very convenient. A lot of the functions we need are built in. It's a great package overall. Before we actually dive into using it, though, I, I think it's helpful to zoom out and take a look at the bigger picture. And what is the path from I want mass data to I have mass data? Step one in this journey is querying for mass observations using metadata of some kind. So that might be the coordinates, RA deck. That might be uh, the exposure time. That might be the wavelength. It could be the mission or a particular filter, right? There's tons of things that you can you can choose to query on. The thing to keep in mind is that you're querying on this concept of an observation, which I like to explain and think of as a telescope pointed at something and took some data. That is the concept of the observation, and you are searching on the associated metadata. It pointed in this direction for this amount of time using this filter. The next step is then to say, well, I have this very interesting observation. I need to get the underlying files that are associated with it now. So we're, we're transitioning from, I've, I've gone from the metadata about it to, I actually want to get the data that's underneath it. Um, and there's a, there's another step that we take there. Uh, you, you might also do some filtering of that, uh, based on calibration level or file type, if you know those things. And, and, and so once you've pared that down a little bit further to the, to the useful files to you, you can then proceed to step three, which is accessing the data. And as I've talked about, either by downloading it or by loading it directly into memory. We're going to mostly focus on the second one of those, uh, because it's, it's something that's, that's novel that not a lot of people have done. So let's get started with step one of our, our workflow. Uh, the easiest way to begin doing these metadata queries is to use one of these three functions that we have available in astroquery.mast. The third one is the most useful, but we'll, we'll talk about all of them because they sort of build up to each other. Query region, which is the first one, uh, will run a query on the, the coordinates you give it and a radius. So you can sort of imagine that cone projecting out into the sky uh, that, that, you would be, that you would be searching on. Query object is really the same thing. You, you give it an object name. We use Ned and Simbad to turn that object name into coordinates. And then we do the same thing, right? Well, once we have coordinates and a radius, well, let's just query that on the sky. A slight caveat here that is important to say in a vanishingly small but non zero number of cases, uh, sometimes the target name is not correctly resolved. So just make sure you, you double check that before you defend any PhD dissertations. I, I personally have never encountered this issue, but but it is present, so it's always good to, to double check that kind of thing. But the final type of query that you might do is the most useful, most versatile, and it's it's the one that I personally use the most often is, is query criteria. So this allows for queries on all of those things I was talking about, like mission, exposure time, all of those interesting things. Um, and the full list of criteria is actually available here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot on this page. Uh, one quick thing I'll point out is this sequence number. Uh, we actually are going to use this later because it's a way to filter on, uh, for example, a, a Kepler quarter, or in our case, a test sector. But I do encourage you to come back to this page and take a look at all the different things that are available to query on. Okay, so those are our three options. We're actually going to start with using some of the some of the simpler ones, just because they're easy to easier to wrap your head around, and the, um, there aren't so many keywords to to handle. For our warm up, we're going to try to answer this question: uh, How many how many targets are there? Uh, 
within one arc minute of the coordinates of uh, Fomoha. So I've already given you the coordinates. We've decided that we're gonna we're gonna resolve them ourselves. We're not just gonna put in the target name. And to begin uh, this query, what we need to do is again we're gonna call our observations dot query underscore. Um, we're gonna use region because we've got coordinates. I'm gonna do something a little different here. I'm gonna append underscore count. Uh, and by doing that, I'll just get the number of results back. So it's a little bit faster than querying for uh, all of the results themselves. Uh, and also, if all you want is the count, that's that's exactly what you should do. Um, it can also be useful if you're querying something and you're not sure what you're going to get back. So it's much easier for us to say, oh, there's 100,000 results here than to hand you a table of 100,000 results and associated metadata. So it's it's faster on your end. It's generally to your advantage to do this. Um, but to return to this query region count, I've given it the coordinates, and I'm also going to give it the radius, if I can spell it right, uh, is one minute. Again, one, we want one arc minute. It will understand if I tell it one minute. We'll run that. We get a warning, but it's okay. It's just letting us know that ICRS, it's interpreting what we've written as an ICRS coordinate, which in fact it is. So there's no issue here. And we've already gotten our answer back. So there are 6,416 observations within this uh, parameter that we specified. Now it is your turn. It is your turn to try a query. So the, the question to answer is how many observations in MAST are within two arc seconds of TRAPPIST-1? To do this, uh, this this is the hint part. There's a there's a hint down below. Something super useful that you can do is when you have your function query. Uh, we'll do sure. We'll do query region. If you append a question mark, shift enter to run. It will give you the doc string. Uh, once again, this would have saved me so much time had I known this trick earlier. But once you do this, uh, it'll tell you what the most useful thing is. That it tells you what the parameters are. So, for example, now I see, oh, coordinates equals, well, right, I'm just taking this first parameter. Oh, radius, I'm taking the second parameter and setting it equal to something. All right, so I'll clear that out of the way. Um, it looks like it is 56. So let's let's take like three to five minutes to, to do this. So let's just call it, um, we'll, we'll check in at the top of the hour. This is the hint um, observations.query object. There are two parameters that you'll want to take a look at. So I'll I'll give us just a little over another minute and then I'll I'll reveal the answer. Sorry if you were still working on this one, but I do want to make sure that we get through um, the rest of the material in this notebook. So I'm gonna reveal the answer maybe a little early here. Uh, what you want to do is use query object and then you'll pass in a target name so we're calling this in uh, the correct criteria name for this is object name equals trappist1 and then we'll pass in the radius um this can be kind of tricky um so you could type in two seconds but actually it's smart enough that if you just type in 2s and run it uh, it will correctly parse that. Um, I have, for the third time today, not typed this incorrectly. Uh, since we want to know how many there are, we can just do, we can append the, the count to, to the end of it. And uh, there we go. And it comes back much faster. 14,665 observations. Uh, this is a very popular target and for good reason. It's a very interesting star, M dwarf star, with seven rocky Earth-esque planets around it that uh, people are very interested to know if they can have uh, atmospheres and, and water because it would be a pretty exciting discovery. All right, queries out of, uh, that query out of the way, let's dive kind of into a particular, a particular search. We're going to look for an image of FOMOHA uh, and we are going to look for an image that was taken by, by TESS. 
and that's one query. I don't know why I said that is two. We are going to query for a formal hot image that comes from the test mission. Uh, this lovely photo here was not taken by the test mission, and so uh, our, our ours won't look quite so nice because that's not what test was designed for. But this is the star. This is our target star. To begin this query, um, we will uh, once again call our our favorite query criteria function, and it's going to give us a table of results. So what I'm going to do here is uh, create a test observations variable test ops that I can pass the table of results to. So test ops is observations dot query criteria. Uh, we will do a couple of things here. Um, the first one is we're going to use the object name as before. Pass in formal hot. I should have picked an easier target name to spell. Give it a radius of two seconds. And this final thing that we're going to use is obs collection. Uh, this corresponds roughly to the idea of, of mission. So we'll tell it test. And just so we can see what's going on, we'll also tell it to print out test ops. So by by writing the test ops variable on its own, um, Jupyter will print it out for us. This is going to be a full query as well. Oh, here we go. And and so we are going to get a table back. This table is actually rather overwhelming. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of information here, and not all of it is relevant to our purposes. <laughs> So what I'll what I'll actually do is show the table, but just the columns of interest, which I've already typed out. So test obs, if I do a little Python indexing here and put columns in these brackets, we will just get back our, our columns of interest, which are these, uh, the ones that I've selected for us, that is. I will very quickly point out a couple of things. Uh, today's session is not really about how the test mission works. Uh, that'll be what we'll talk about about in more depth next time, but it's also hard to just be presented with something like this and not have any context uh, and take something useful out of it. The results that we're looking at right now, um, generally you can think about in two different ways. Uh, there's the test FFI, which stands for full frame image. And then there are these other weird things that have numbers and are labeled as time series data. So the test mission uh, has an enormous field of view on the sky. It's great at surveying big parts of the sky, and it does that for roughly monthly cadences. Its field of view is 24 by 90, 96 degrees. So it's it's pretty large. Right? It covers a, a pretty big chunk of the sky. Um, and this is broken up. Uh, there's four cameras, each each of which has a 26 by 26 square um, square field of view. Uh, by observing these stars over time, you can, uh, especially over such a, a large area of the sky, by observing these stars over time and very precisely monitoring the brightness, you can do, uh, you can look for things like exoplanets or monitor uh, stars for variability. These two different results come from the nature of the mission, right? We're, we're pointing at this very large chunk of the sky and we're just taking images over and over and over again. The FFIs, full frame images, correspond to that idea of that big chunk of the sky that I'm looking at. The other thing that you're seeing, these time series uh, data correspond to that. Well, let's do a little bit of transformation to, to create, to turn these images into uh, brightnesses over time. So we're not going to talk too much more about that today. If you're interested in that, please join us for the next one. Um, but it's just a, a good, a useful distinction to make here. Couple other things that you might want to notice in this table: uh, sequence number, that is the test sector. So again, on a month, on a roughly monthly cadence, tests observes particular patches of patches of the sky, um, and these are just the different uh, numberings in that sequence. So we've got two from sector two, we've got two from sector twenty nine, and two from sector sixty nine. The two other columns that I'll point out are at the end here. Uh, there's data rights, which is public. One of the great things about the test mission is that the data is immediately public as soon as it is available in the archive. You can access all of this stuff, which is which is great. There's there's not a whole lot of barrier to entry. The other thing that I'll very quickly mention is this distance column. Some of you might have been looking at these uh, these coordinates and said, "Now hang on, 
those those coordinates aren't the same. How can it be that uh, the distance on all of these is listed as zero? And the reason for this is that our input coordinates, the ones that we have searched on, when it gives us a distance, it is measuring the distance from our input coordinates to the observation. If our input coordinates have fallen into the observation, and in this case for tests, into that, that big observing window on the sky, well, the distance is zero. It's inside the observation. And so that's why all of these are, are zero, because some of these observations are so big that our coordinates just fall into them anyway. All right, so that's kind of an overview of what we're looking at the uh, the observations that we've gotten back. For the purposes of this webinar, we are going to just filter this down to one observation. There's not a particularly scientifically compelling reason for the filtering that we're about to do, but uh, we you we just want to narrow down our options a little bit and the tools uh, you would use regardless. Um, so if you had a real query that you were doing, this is how you would do it. You could filter things down by doing a clever little NP uh, NumPy bitwise and, and and comparing where the test obs match this particular criteria. It's actually easier to just reformat the query. Um, the, the time it takes to figure out how to handle AstroPy table uh, indexing is, is lost um, when compared to just rewriting the query. So query criteria, uh, again, as before, we're going to set a couple of different things. So target name equals test FFI. Sequence number is 29. Again, this corresponds to the idea of a sector. Um, don't freak out. I, I did just hit enter because there's a, a comma there. Uh, Python will, will know that I've skipped lines. Omahot is still the object name. And the radius is 2 seconds. All right, before I hit enter on this query, uh, there's another question that might be popping into people's heads. Oops, I did not spell that right. Observation stopped. I've used target name and I've used object name. So, so what gives? Those sound very similar, right? What could the difference be? The difference is that object name is what we've been using so far. And that takes what I've gotten, um, excuse me, that, that takes the object name that you feed into the API. It, it looks that up in net, net or Simbad, and then it returns coordinates. Target name is the name as reported by the mission that observed it. For example, TESS FFI, or this string of numbers here, which corresponds to the star Fomalhaut in the TESS input catalog, which is their big catalog of all the optically persistent uh, sources of light in the sky. We do not control the target name. The target name is handed to us by the missions. So searching on target name generally isn't uh, something that will apply to every mission unless they're very consistent with their naming standards as the test mission is. Um, and so this isn't the one that you would want to go to immediately. The object name is the one that you would typically use more often. Um, but that is an important distinction, right? Here's a name, please look up the coordinates versus please match this name exactly according to what the missions have called all of their targets. Let's dive right into step two. We've gotten our observations. We now need to do the next step, which is what is the actual data underneath that? What what um, what are the files that, that are hidden under there that I, that I want to get access to? Now, there's a pretty straightforward function to do this. So the call for this, um, and again, we need to save it somewhere. So data products equals observations.get product list. And we're going to pass in our observations from before. So test obs, remember, is just this thing that we filtered. Uh, and then I'm going to do something a little weird. I'm going to say print the length of the data products and also print data products, but just the first three of them. You'll see why I did that in just a second once that once that query comes back. And 
Yeah, hint, 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 there's a reason why it took a second there. There are 7,270 underlying files associated with this observation, which is a lot. Um, it, that is because of the way the full frame images are stored based on not just a camera. I mentioned there are four cameras looking at the sky, but each camera is actually made out of four separate CCDs, which is the device that the test uses to um, convert the, the light that's coming into the actual signal. So there's a lot in here. We could try to filter this down, uh, you know, based on a, a particular reasoning that, uh, you know, there's, there's something interesting happened in this part of the sky, uh, but this, we're, we're not really at the stage where, where uh, we would do that. And there's not a great uh, way to do this in the API. We, we probably would have filtered on that a little bit earlier. This is sort of a strange thing that we're doing here. So I have arbitrarily selected one of these 7,000 files that we're going to open up to plot. Again, there are many, many uh, scientifically valid, interesting reasons why you would do something like this uh, with, with the test data or why you would want to access test data. You just probably wouldn't do it this way, but it's okay. we're, we're still getting in the, the practice that we need. So I'm going to create a um, a filter to get my filtered image. Uh, and for that, I'm going to use observations. This is a new one dot filter products. And I will pass in my data products from above. So this is my list of 7,000 objects. I'm going to add a filter for OBS ID uh, based on the fixed ID that I have above. And then we'll add a filter on description. So on description, a filter on description is something that you might actually do. Uh, like in this case, we're adding one for a calibrated full frame image. Uh, since we've already put in the OBS ID and that is unique, that's not really eliminating anything for us, but uh, it is helpful to see this, this here. Okay, as expected, a unique OBS ID produces one result. That's That's good. That's what we wanted to see. So we've got one calibrated full frame image. Step three, which I think I'll just dive right into, uh, and we'll save any questions for, for the end, just in the interest of time, uh, is data access. This cell right here is uh, gives you code that would allow you to download things either to disk or even on Tyke. That's all I'm gonna say about that because that's not the uh, preferred option for this workflow. It's not the, the new exciting thing that we're trying to show you. Um, and there's lots of tutorials uh, available on other NAST sites if you wanna learn how to just download things directly. Instead, what we're going to do is this streaming to memory. Well, in order to do that, we need to know where it's at. So it's easy if you download something, you know, you would say, oh, it's in my download slash documents directory, and this is the name of the file. We need the cloud equivalent of that, which isn't immediately obvious. Uh, but fortunately, there's yet another function for that. Uh, so the observations dot get cloud URIs, plural, and we can pass in our uh, our files to it that we found. I'm calling this CURI for Cloud Uniform Resource Indicator. You can call this variable whatever you want. But when I run this, uh, filtered images is not defined. Yes, what did I call it? Filtered image. Uh, and this is it. So this is the equivalent, right? There's no downloads folder. It's ST public data slash tests, which is the mission, slash public, FFI, and then this very long string that uh, of of directories that we've used to organize this file. Once you have this path, that is sufficient to begin opening things. So as I alluded to earlier, one of the key fun uh, one of the key packages we need is um, the S3 file systems. By doing the uh, this syntax with FS open, passing in the cloud URI. Um, also, if you just saw me index this, the reason I did that is because this is a list. These brackets around this indicate that this is a Python list, and I just want the first value in this, which is this string here. Um, but by passing this to the FS open, uh, what that does is uh, allows us to actually get this get this file streamed to our machine. It, it tricks it tricks the, the Python into thinking that this file is local. Once we've done that, we can actually read in the fits file with a program that knows how to properly read it in. So 
uh, in this case, we're going to use fits.open. Uh, and we're going to pass in the file handle that we just that we just opened up. And then we're going to tell it read only as HDU list. Okay. I'm going to type a whole bunch of things and then we'll talk about what's going to come out of this. So I'm typing HDU list.info and I'm typing image equals HDU list one. Uh, I need to be careful with my capitalization. HDU list one dot data header is equal to HDU list also one dot header WCS equals WCS of the header. Okay, this will all make sense once we print this out. Don't worry. Header, show me the first 10 items in that header. So what this just popped out is that it's opened up the fits file and it's given us information about the, the, the fits file itself. There's a primary HDU header data unit. There is this one here, which has calibrated data from the camera CCD, which is great. That's what we're looking for. Uh, and then HDU2 has the uncertainty. Not looking for that, but good to know it's there. The other thing that we printed out is the first bit of the header. The header is the uh, metadata in each one of these HDUs that tells us about the rest of the contents of it. So in this case, it tells us, uh, you can see, it's giving us the size of the image. So 2136 by 2078 is in fact the, the, the size, the dimensions of the image that we're gonna be looking at. And it's also stated up here. The header also has information in it about, for example, how long the exposure was or where the telescope uh, was pointed. That's how we're gonna uh, use this WCS by passing in um, the header information. There's the software will parse what's going on and allow us to not just plot the image, but also to plot the image correctly on the sky. So we've gotten the WCS, we've gotten, we've read the header, we've also read the data out of this calibrated, uh, calibrated HDU. Now let's plot it. And to do that, we're gonna use matplotlib. And there's just a couple of things that we have to set up. Uh, so the first thing is plt.figure. This is just saying, please give me a, a 12 by 12 figure. You can use any size. I think this is probably a, a, a good one, but so long as it's square, because we're plotting a square image. Plot.subplot, and we're doing this so we can pass in this projection parameter and giving it WCS lowercase, which again is the result of this line up here. Uh, and so it's read in information from the header and is giving us the, the coordinates we need. Now we'll plot the image using plot.imshow. Uh, we're going to pass image data. We're going to set a couple of things. So vmin uh, is the, the minimum brightness that we want. Uh, and what I'm doing here with np numpy dot percentile is saying, please take the image data and give me the sixth percentile. I'm going to do the same thing with vmax. vmax is np dot percentile image, oops, image, uh, and 97. Now, why am I doing this? Uh, answer, because stars are very bright and space is very dark. Uh, your images will look very funny if you do not account for this fact. Uh, the, the last thing is the color map. Uh, really the only thing that makes sense for tests, I would argue, is gray. Uh, it's not observing in multiple filters, really, or doing interesting things. So uh, gray is best. If you want to do something fun, you could type Inferno and you'll get a nice, colorful, colorful image, but the colors are meaningless. So I, I prefer not to do that. Uh, and now I'm at the bottom here, I'm just adding some uh, labels. So plot.x label and plot.y label. I will shift enter to run that. Uh, and since I've done it correctly, uh, here it is. I do want to save time uh, for questions, but I'm just going to very, very quickly point out three key features of this image. One, we found Fomoha. Yay, we did it. Uh, this this bright star here and uh, is is our target. It does not have diffraction spikes, although it might look like that. Um, there's nothing in Tess's field of view that would cause this diffraction. Instead, this is uh, an overload of the detector. This star is so bright that 
uh, the electrons on that spot of the detector are like overflowing in a, in a line um, along this channel. The second thing to point out is in the lower left here, you might have noticed this kind of blotchy pattern. Uh, this is likely caused by stars that are just outside of the field of view that are that are sort of causing this strange effect. The other thing uh, is that if you take a look at this, you'll notice at the very bottom, the background is super, super dark. Like it's it's very nearly completely black. Up at the top of the image, though, not quite so much, right? It's a little bit more of a, a lighter gray color. And you can see this gradient as it goes across the, the whole field of view. This is probably scattered light from uh, the Earth or from the moon. This is uh, often a thing that crops up in, in test data. But we've done it. We did it. Yay. This was our this was our goal to open something on the cloud. Uh, you'll notice in your directory, nothing got downloaded. We opened it right into memory, plotted an image. Uh, next time on Mass Summer Webinar, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about Tyke, and plotting light curves and the test mission. And so I hope you're able to join us for that. But for now, that is all from me.